I heard Pat Mills need Mr. Mr. Uh, Cooney's going there. Or Thanksgiving. That's really all I got. There's a canal where I've heard. Alright, so. Do we get to this? Yeah. 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 Do we mention the flag at all? Yeah. They cut out the spot. It's yeah, and in fact they found it in an attic, rolled up in a ball. Actually, I mean, what a great, but you gotta understand something. The flag really, I mean, no one really cared that much about it. It wasn't that big of a deal until kind of the weird kind of ultra nationalism in World War One, especially World War One. And then also, no, the flag, the flag would become more important as, as more than just a symbol. But even then, it's still crazy. That's a great find. When I first went to the Smithsonian Museum of American History, you walked in. And it was hanging from a four, um, this four-story wall, and the flag was hanging there, and it was it was spectacular. But the problem was it was literally dissolving away. But now it's back, and it's not protected. And they that, did I mention what they did to it? So it's it's really cool. Have you want been to the Smithsonian? One, two, it's awesome. And there's a, it's really, some parts really well organized, some parts it's like little, I think of like an older fashioned museum where they just have a stuff piled up. Here's stuff, oh wow! <laughs> but it's really, 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 really cool. Should we go? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Field trip. Field trip. All right, you guys start hitchhiking. Huh? You have to make the freshman. Oh yeah, we'll extort money from freshmen. I mean, <laughs> Find legitimate business dealings. <laughs> <laughs> Lemonade. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Lemonade, aka casino. No. <laughs> 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 That'd be great. Somebody bought another good one. Well, they bombarded it. I, so we had Francis Stocky, right? Uh, in the morning, he saw the flag and he had a tune in his head, and inspired him to write The Star Spangled Banner. And this is the verse that everybody knows with the very dramatic picture of Francis Scott Key, which that was nothing at all like what happened, but. <laughs> and he wrote it. It's a four stanza poem. The poem has a leader musical. That's the verse that everybody knows. There are three others. And it's a good fighting song. <laughs> so it talks about seeing the flag and what that meant is basically when the flag was still there, McHenry was not reduced, using the terminology of the time. It survived. But we have the ramparts, which are those mounds in front, eventually become masonry. And the rockets red glare, bombs bursting. Good fighting song. Now, let's be clear about it. It's not the best fighting national anthem. That's the USSR anthem. <laughs> which is gone now. You know, remember? You remember? Yeah, the French National Anthem has blood flowing in the streets. I mean, that is one bloody, violent song. And every time they try to change it, let's have, you know, flowers and birds. No! The French like to fight. So, that is the actual verse of this. The four verses. And this would become kind of controversial. And it started a little bit what happened with when the uh, professional athletes started not uh, staying for the National Anthem to... Um, to complain about certain uh, more anything else police practices, but also the way African Americans were being treated, and a valid point because the third verse does make very clear that it's about killing slaves. Why? Because the British were actively recruiting slaves, just like the Revolutionary War. Six thousand would be recruited, including nearly a thousand on this raid. They actually formed a a regiment of the Royal Marines that fought with the British. And so the British were fighting for freedom, arguably. Okay, it was for cynical reasons to win a war, but he's basically saying, we're going to catch him in the gloom of the grave. So it's talking about slavery. Yeah. Okay, what? okay so after the war, what happens to all those uh, regiments of slaves? Good question. What, like, it's like we planned this, Chris and I. Okay, okay, I want you to ask this question. <laughs> yeah, good question, because what happened to them? They can't go back, right? They went to Canada for a while, but men particularly like Canada. You know, the, seven, the 17 months of winter, 
kind of bother them. So, so they went to Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, and they were called, I think this is great, Americans. <laughs> really? And their descendants, that's a home of one. There's a grave. They're still called that. That's one of the Royal Marines. I can think that. And they fought for their freedom. Yeah, they couldn't go back home, and then in home was in slavery. So life is complex, but the descendants still live there in Trinidad, which is just north of Colombia, Venezuela, right there in the Caribbean. Where'd they go? The Trinidad and Tobago. So just Trinidad. The island is Trinidad. The country today is Trinidad and Tobago. And here is, I like the defense of Fort McHenry, the tune and a Creon in heaven. And that is the tune that he had in heaven. Did I mention that in class? Good. And a Creon in heaven. And a Creon in heaven. This is the actual song for the Anacreonic Society. And what it was is those who celebrated the the Greek god Bacchus. Who knew who the Greek god Bacchus was? The god of, yes, wine. This was a drinking society. And the, the song that he had in head is this song. It's hard to read, especially when that's an S. I know it looks like an F. It's an S. That's how they did it. That's how the Fire. printing press did S. Did it. In fire, in fire, pyro. But it's supposed to be fire. But I like the whole thing was meant to be screamed around a piano while they're drinking. So if anybody tries to sing the national anthem and drink and sing it nice and pure, it's really hard, isn't it? It's high, there's well, I mean, it's low, then it goes really high. And most people, except for maybe me and a few others that know I I I'm very good at singing the national anthem poorly. I love it. God F. It kind of, it kind of like sounds like so much to it. Kind of does have a little like a list, doesn't it? Yeah. But the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus is mine. <laughs> Over the land of the free and the home of the brave, it's the same meter. And so that is why it is so difficult to sing. What's that? <laughs> we're, we're, we're. <laughs> oh, a fake for part. <laughs> That's another uh, Greek reference. Yeah. Well, the thing is this: there's no real national anthem. Most countries do not have one. Occasionally, there'll be some, but they do other. There are other songs. My country tis of thee in America. We're also kind of considered to be the national song. But in 1916, partially because even though the U.S. wasn't involved yet, but World War One. Wilson would make the Star Spangled Banner the national anthem. And the reason why is simple. My country, Tizabi, it's the same exact music as, well, at that time, God Save the King. Yeah. And so we don't want the same song as the British, which is now God Save the Queen. And so, 1916, by executive order, 1931, it would become the national anthem. So, we want, so this one by default. Yeah, basically, you're right. And it's kind of popular, and it's kind of fun to sing. If you weren't trying to sing well. <laughs> and during World War II, they that's kind of a fit of, of nationalism. They started playing it during the games. Then it went away, and then it kind of came back because of the Cold War and sure we're not godless commies. And now it's become this tradition that uh, in fact my brother-in-law was here from Germany and he is just in awe of this. He remembers when he was an exchange student in Whitefish in the late 80s. He was like, I couldn't believe there was that during the national anthem. We did that in Germany. Did, well, I did remind them of Germany. <laughs> that whole Nazi thing. <laughs> but it just, it's so unheard of. And then I also, to be honest, I don't know why we don't do national anthems before we eat dinner, <laughs> <laughs> movies. <laughs> Wouldn't that be right before class? We should. <laughs> I'm not necessarily saying that's good or bad, but it is curious we do that before sporting events, isn't it? But I, I like the song. It's really hard to sing. So, what happened though was McHenry did not fall. And so both the British decided it's not worth it. We burned down Washington, D.C., and they fled. They retreated. Baltimore did not get burnt down. 
But that's where we get the Star Spangled Banner. And now, we've already mentioned this class, and I want to get to the last little bit of the war, but the Treaty of Ghent was actually being negotiated, and it was signed. The war is essentially over, like nothing happened. There's John Quincy Adams, whose father was with John Adams. He negotiated it. We'll come back to John Quincy Adams, so don't worry about him right now. But while that's one other big thing was happening, with the disaster of Washington falling, Federalists met what's called the Hartford Convention. I don't know why it's letters are not docked, but I just thought that. New England was the only real place where Federalists were strong. They were opposed to the war, and they met in secret. And they talked nullification of the war. Remember nullification from the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions? Even secession. They also said no more presidents from Virginia. But they talked this about this if the war continues. Fortunately, we didn't have that constitutional crisis because the war ended. But it made the Federalists look like they didn't like their country. In fact, it killed the Federalists. It just killed them. They never recovered. And by, 19, by 1820, the Federalist Party would disappear. I love this cartoon because on the left, it shows Republicans. And this idea, you know, that that's Columbia and their virtuation, no corruption. And that's supposed to represent a ballot box. Voting was becoming more prominent, suffering, at least for men. But here's the Federalist Hartford Convention candidate. Is that? Would you say? Beelzebub. That kind of hurt my voice. So, with that, one more fight is going on. And in reality, it's called part of the War of 1812, but it's kind of an extension of the same war that was Tippy Canoe. Remember Tecumseh went south and missed Tippy Canoe? Well, he was trying to get the creek and the Choctaw. So the War of 1812 would be used as an excuse for the United States to get rid of the creek and Choctaw threat to the expansion into what is now Alabama and Mississippi, then it was Mississippi Territory. And U.S. forces would be led by Andrew Jackson, who is becoming a prominent plantation owner and also militia commander and lawyer in Tennessee. And he was a true example of somebody coming from, well, he was an orphan with nothing. And through his own hard work and being the, I would argue, the toughest man ever to live, I'll, show, I'll tell you why in a little bit, you'll be in awe of Andrew Jackson. He would lead them, yes. Uh, could you go back a slide and the last two documents? I, I, nullification and... Uh, oh, nullification and secession. And the big thing is it made the Federalists look really unpatriotic. <coughs> we'll come back to that term patriotism in a sec. Jackson would lead now with militia and soldiers into what is now Alabama to attack the creek. The British did help the creek a little bit, but you know the creek were basically fighting on their own. Creek were a powerful tribe, but after Timmy Canoe, they're probably not alone to be strong enough, even with their Choctaw allies. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, I, mean, I, to, like, I thought it was a normal pen for a second. Then I was in the lights out. That's awesome. Well, part of the fight, and one of the reasons why Jackson's forces are going to be so upset, Fort Mims is right here. And that was a small little basically wooden stockade that was kind of there to defend American U.S. settlers who were, I want to be clear about it stealing land from the creek and the Choctaws. But the creek attacked Fort Mint in early 1814. And Fort Mint right here took the fort, because there's almost nobody defending it, and killed everybody in the fort. Over 500 people, most were settlers, so the men, women, and children there. Hey, this is the kind of fight that's going to be no prisoners taken in reality by either side. And you could argue one side had a legitimate claim, but they're no saints. I mean, this is not perfect. Or one is noble and one isn't. But you can imagine when word of this got back to Jackson's army. Remember Mims. Which I know sounds really weird to say today, but remember this. So when they got a hold of a creek encampment, the biggest one at Horseshoe Bend, 
They attacked it, and this battle would be decisive. A huge victory for General Jackson in the United States. The Creeks would be decimated, a combination of being a surprise, and a number of things worked out right for the United States. See that diorama there? That's actually a little model diorama that's there. It's, you know, it's not this big, but that's just a picture of it. Really bloody fight. And after the fight, U.S. soldiers kept the killing going on for, for hours. Why did they do it? For revenge for men. Let's be clear about it. Like I said, there's no good guys here. It's much more complex than that. But this is going to destroy, forever destroy, the Creeks and the Choctaws. Yeah. Some did. Most were wearing whatever they had. But they put them in the diorama, most of them had uniforms. And one more thing we must add. Jackson actually, a number of different times, ordered his men not to do this. They went against orders. I mean, it's just it rage, and also war does it. It's one of the reasons why war is such a horrific thing. But he ordered them not to. But in the future, weak opponents are going to take this and say, Jackson ordered this. And Jackson is bloodthirsty maniac. How can you have a democracy when you elect people like this animal? And the thing about it is, is Jackson, a complex man, but that reputation of him, more and more people now say is reality. And so when they're talking about taking Jackson off the $20 bill, I had heard these people talking about all these horrible things that Jackson did. So yeah, I'm not defending Jackson 100%, but a lot of it was anti-Jackson propaganda that repeated over and over again became the truth. And Jackson actually know that isn't what happened. But I'm not saying Jackson wasn't it. Pretty he could be pretty horrible too. Well, this is gonna set up the Battle of New Orleans. And the Battle of New Orleans, the Battle of New Orleans would take place two weeks after the war ended. The reason why this is important is because okay, the Creek War we had to mention is Horseshoe Bay. Oh, I almost forgot to say something. Horseshoe Bay would pretty much end any resistance in the Southwest. Those tribes could not fight. The Seminole would try, actually technically they never surrendered, but the other ones. So when the states try to remove those tribes in the old Southwest, they had no choice but the nation groups. It's just, it's, it's, it's a tragic last stand. But back to this. Because the war is over, but the British didn't know it. Jackson is there with his malicious forces, and he recruited people from New Orleans, famously pirates. Louisiana's a great place for pirates, all the bayous and swamps. And so if you're thinking, maybe down the road, it's a career, it's not about pirating. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, the benefits, you know, pretty good. Good health plan. So you're saying we, we had pirates, I.D.? Yeah. That's actually kind of cool. Look, uh, Paul the Fat. Yeah, was one of the most famous pirates in American history. He fought the Jacks. Basically, it was truce. <laughs> we got to beat the British. Well, the British were under the command of an experienced general by the name of Edward Packenham. And the reason why I wanted to put Edward, Edward Packenham is there is because I just frankly enjoy saying Packenham. <laughs> and he was a very talented general. And the thing was, is he had to wait until after hurricane season. So when they went in November and December to go attack Louisiana, they're negotiating camp. The treaty was signed when he was landing. He had no idea. Now, the thing was, this map kind of shows it. Here's Louisiana, which is all swamp. The Mississippi was not one clean channel then. So, and it really meandered. It's, it's only like, what, 20 miles as a crow would fly, but it's 100 miles to go by the river. That's how much it winds. But what they did is they landed on this, it's called Lake Bourne, and just crossed overland and attacked New Orleans is right here. So on this map, by the way, it does have arrows, so I'm comforted by them. <laughs> and New Orleans is up. So this map, New Orleans is up here. Here's the river. The British were coming this way. This is all sugar plantation. They have little ditches running through it to keep it drained, but sugar you grow in that swamp. So it's drained swamp. So think about this just um, muddy, wet, awful thing. The battle's going to be January 8th. Think about awful that would have been in January. 
Here's swamp lands. So basically, all Jackson had to do was line up on one of these ditches. There's an already a four foot dike to make sure it doesn't flood too much. Mound it up more, and you got a nice fort going. If you go there, it's about this high now, but it's still there. And from the river to the swamp. What's in the swamp? Gators. Gators, gators, gators. And not just one gator, stack a wall of gators. <laughs> you can't see the swamp for the gators. But the British plan was they marched here and had its men. Pakenham had them huddle all the night before the 8th of January. Then their plan was to attack in the morning. The temperature got down to about 31 degrees. Now think about sitting in swampy land at 31 degrees. Can you imagine how miserable those guys were? And the guys leading the charge were going to have like 12 foot ladders. And the idea was they would come up to that first ditch, lay the ladder over like a bridge, and then they kind of cross it. You know? <laughs> then the next guy would put a ladder up over that, now a big eight foot mound and climb over. Think about what every step is going to be like in that ground. It's ice cold, maybe a little layer of frost over it, and what are you going to do? It was just like muck, you suck you. But the, my favorite part is just imagine those guys with the ladders. You know, I'm just thinking, <laughs> running at them with ladders. Volunteers, who wants to carry the ladder? <laughs> well, it was a disaster because they're sitting right behind this great fortified line and they could just pack away, pack away at it. Now, this is a lithograph of it. And it shows a little bit how it is a little, a little fancified. This was going to be a diversion almost broke through. But right here, the British forces kind of got munched together because the swamp kind of pushed them together. And they got mowed down in lines. Only one place that they get near the American lines. At the end of a couple hours, it was a slaughter. Look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. Not partially because they're behind the fortified line, but they attacked in the open. And you don't need to know the exact numbers. It's a huge U.S. victory. But, or this will make Jackson's career, for those pretty soldiers, for the private soldiers, you know, the enlisted men, they just throw in the swamp for skater food. <laughs> yeah, I know. Packenham was more than he was a hero of what's called the Peninsula Camp. It's this British hero, Pakenham. So they took his body back for a funeral's funeral in, did I say hero? What did I say? I can't even say the word again. Funeral's funeral. Did you mean heroes? I know, I didn't mean that at all. Yeah, you're exactly right. A hero's funeral. So they brought the body back to Lake Point. His wife was actually on board one of the ships. That's how she found out her husband died. How do you get a body from Lake Bourne to England and not have it be uh, just this thing? <laughs> it's going to take over six weeks. In the Royal Navy, this is the way it was until World War II, every sailor would get two cups, which are basically two ounces of grog. You know what grog is? Yeah, it's just whatever alcohol they could kind of put together in a barrel. So it might have some rum and whiskey and gin and stuff you don't want to think about. It's just kind of thrown in about 20% alcohol. They get two little, like, basically just two little cocktails. That was their ration. So they had a barrel, third floor, rum. <laughs> rum, actually, it was rum. About 20% alcohol. So alcohol preserves, right? So they stuffed the body in there. Right? He didn't care anymore. And then they nailed it shut. <laughs> now, took longer than they thought. The winds were bad, rough seas. So, oh, oh, a little bit over halfway there. So, we're, man, we're talking about four weeks. They still, well, still just barely halfway. They ran out of grog, as legend would happen on board that ship. When they pulled into, I believe it was Portsmouth, when they pulled in and pulled the barrel out and opened it, it was dry, except for this gray thing. <laughs> um, so, what it appears is that some of the men got very thirsty, and they were not picky. 
And if you go, uh, where is it? At St. Paul's Cathedral, I think. Is it St. Paul's or the Tower of London? I think it's St. Paul's. The Pakenham's little crypt is there. A little crypt. They have a bunch of crypts for all the British heroes there. In fact, I found it. I was looking for Isaac Newton. I was looking for Newton's crypt. I remember I'm kind of looking around. I said, those on the floor. And you're walking on these crypts. That's kind of a surreal thing. <laughs> walking on, I was kind of looking on the wall. Hey, Pakenham! All right, so... Was it like still in the shape of a body, or was it like it was kind of body shape, <laughs> but it was gray, cauliflower. Okay, so the thing about this was, think about what happened. The capital was burnt. The United States humiliated, barely survived. This treaty was meaningless and reality like nothing ever happened. Then all of a sudden, you have this battle. And Americans felt, well, what after this battle? Huh? Yeah, invincible. We won. Yes! New Orleans and Jackson became the biggest hero in the United States. I can't even begin to describe how big a hero Jackson was. Probably overshadowed. In fact, the only one would be like George Washington might overshadow Jackson. And what we have in there is a wave of nationalism. Nationalism. No, we don't want nationalism. What is it? Yeah. You love your country because it's your country. Right? Because I love my country. Because it's my country. And because it's my country, I love my country. Let me just keep going. But remember, patriotism is loving your country of what it stands for. So a patriot might actually be upset at some things their country might do. Because they think it goes against the values they believe it should stand for. Nationalists, basically, no. If they, if they just, America, love it or leave. Well, nationalism spread. And this kind of started in the French Revolution and Europe and spread overseas. And these are kind of these nationalistic ideas. First off, we said this once before, this kind of personified Americans. We are special. What makes us special? Our continent. Two. The Indian threat to expansion was gone. Basically gone. Oh, there's still empires. But the United States now, it's inevitable. Especially once the Industrial Revolution comes. Next. The thing about it was, we survived. We kept New Orleans. Sure, they burnt the capital, but they left, didn't they? The Federalist Party died. There's going to be one party by 1820. The Republicans were the only party. Yet that hit all sorts of big issues. Next. I better make that sound again, you can leave. The Transportation <laughs> Revolution. Remember how they couldn't move troops around when they invaded Washington? The Transportation Revolution. Roads, canals, and then the biggie, railroads. We'll get to all those layers. Just need to know the Transportation Revolution. It's going to go hand in hand with this. That will change everything. Because of the British blockade, the Industrial Revolution. Couldn't get those textiles from Britain. One of the weird things, War of 1812, the actual battles are not important enough fights. The treaty technically did nothing. It had such huge impact on the psyche of the United States. This was trying to Figure or trigger this nationalist growth, growth as a country, and also the real fight within. So with that, a couple of things real quick. We go right to the era of good feelings. We won! And there's basically, the era of good feelings is, is we won the war, but there's only one political party. 1816 Monroe would be elected president. Look how the Federalists, look at all their, see that just a few states? 1820. I didn't put a map on this, put it on 1820. 1820, Monroe would win all the electoral votes but one. Why one? Because that one voter voted for somebody else, so Washington would be the only unanimous one. That's the only reason they voted for somebody else. It gives the illusion that all the divides in the country from, remember the growth of the parties and after the Constitution, they're away, they're gone away. But in reality, no. All the problems were still there. They were hidden and would explode in 1820 and 1824. But it seemed to be good. 
there's Monroe. I just put that picture up there. He looks like George Washington. In fact, he was born in the hometown of George, or the same town as George Washington. The city of presidents, Fredericksburg, Virginia. If you get a chance, go. It's a cool town. One success, we've got to put it in there, it's a convention of 1818. This was with Britain. Britain and the United States began to start negotiating deals. And the thing was, this set up the border. See it right here? The border of the United States today. Britain, U.S. claimed here, Britain claimed here. They just said, let's just cut it in half. So the 49th parallel. You notice it ends at the continental divide, but... An important idea of coming together with Britain. And another one with Spain. The Adams Onus Treaty. The Adams Onus, the United States would buy Florida and also kind of solidify this border between New Spain and Louisiana. But now it's called Missouri territory. But the US won Florida. Yeah, there are a few reasons you know, to keep this in the US border. But you know the big reason why they wanted it? You can't grow anything there. What's in Florida? Gate oranges. Swamps and gators. Yeah. And what? Oranges. <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> And now every crazy crime that's ever been committed in the U.S., you don't even need to know what state, or they don't have to tell you, it's in Florida, right? Yeah. yeah. It's crazy crime. Oh, we're in Florida. Orlando. Okay. <laughs> but you know why? And this is also part of the reason why the U.S. invaded in Jackson kind of did some of it on its own for the first Seminole War. One that is not emphasized enough. Slaves were running away to Florida. Yeah. They were joining the Seminole tribe who welcomed them, eagerly welcomed them in. The Seminoles were made of a bunch of former tribes that so many have died of disease. You have to cut off that sanctuary. So much of what we're going to do is because of slavery. Yeah. Um, so when you Florida? The U.S. got Florida, but this is Spain here too. And so it made this border because it was unclear. Let's get to one more big foreign policy issue. Oh, no, I jumped the gun. Also, the American system. Oh, the American system was Henry Clay's idea to grow what they were calling more and more the market, early capitalism. A national system. Henry Clay, remember he was one of the war hawks. And his name is going to be forever. Go, go with Henry Clay, the American system. The first part is that protecting tariff. Remember we talked about Hamilton wanting that? Do you remember that? And a protecting tariff would be passed, 1816. It also wanted... The Bank of the U.S. And it would come back after the disaster of getting rid of it in 1812. The second bank of the United States. We'll come back to that bank. Only a 20-year charter like before. But tariff, bank, and internal improvements. Internal improvements are things like roads, canals, bridges. Today we'd say infrastructure, which is crumbling. But the idea is there can't be economic growth unless you have good roads, you have good bridges. And the United States, we, the taxpayers through the federal government, pay for that. There could not be business without the government doing this. And the National Road is a good example of this. And this is going to be debated all the way up to the Civil War. Even after Henry Clay would pass away in 1850, they were still going to talk about these things. It's Henry Clay's American system. But here's the thing. This looks like Hamilton's vision. And so you're going to get the descendants of the Republicans saying, wait a second, you're going to use all this taxpayer money and programs to enrich those merchants, what we're soon going to call capitalists. The divides are coming. The Republican Party is divided, and it'll be kind of personified by the first real economic panic of the new economy, 1819. The panic of 1819 over speculation in land, over speculation in these new textile mills, which we'll get to a little bit later, led to bank closing. We're not going to go to all the details, all the panic starts. I'm going to spend one day and talk about that. But this new economic system that's just being created called capitalism can lead to a lot of insecurities. And so you can imagine how 
people who still remember Jack Jefferson's warning about this, saying, "This is why we got to we can't have these banks." And then men like Clay say, "No, this is just a glitch. Economic growth will enrich us all." But we're coming to the biggie, the big thing that showed the problems that divided the country: the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise is going to be 1820. I got to give a little bit of background right here. By 1819, all these states in pink were part of the Union now. Now, remember the Northwest Ordinance. It said no slave codes, so basically no slavery here. But all these were now slave states. Louisiana came in and had slaves. Slave states. There was a rough balance between slave states and free states. Rough balance. There was a balance. Now, what branch of the government, what branch of the legislature, has even number per state? The Senate. So there was a senatorial balance. But the population, the population was growing faster in which section? Yeah. And they're getting more members in the house. Before we get to that though. People were bringing their slaves into the fertile Missouri Valley, and this is what started the Missouri Compromise. Missouri wanted to become a state. Missouri wanted to become a state. A slave state with slave codes. And the thing was, this is the first state that's going to come in from the Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana itself was kind of an aberration because it had already a lot of people there. This kind of was a constitutional crisis. Northerners did not want the expansion of slave power. Remember slave power, that three-fifths compromise? Do you remember that? They didn't want that. So, in the House, James Talmadge of New York proposed an amendment to the bill that said, sure, Missouri can become a state with post-Navy emancipation. That's Talmadge. New York had done post Navy emancipation, so they said, yeah, you can come in the slaveholders and keep their slaves. But any, well, what does post Navy mean? After? Hmm? Say it again. Is it like after 25? So when they turn 25, they're free. So what does Navy mean? You ever heard of prenatal care? Like? Same deal. Post Navy means 25 years after they're born. New York did it 19 and 21, 19 for women, 21 for female slaves. He proposed 25. The actual date is not important to know that. After they're born, any slave born after Missouri became a state, when they turned 25, they're free. Now, Thomas did not do this because he wanted to free the slaves and bring equality and justice to this ab abhorrent system. He did it because of this. He wanted. to help the slaveholders. The slaveholders, so they would not lose all the money they had invested in slavery. And he also wanted this. And this is horrific, and this has been kind of whitewashed by the North. They don't want to talk about it. They also wanted to make sure that those freed slaves don't live in New York. They wanted them gone. They wanted a white state. How does it do it? How does it help the slaveholders get rid of freed slaves? We know it's awful. It is human being murdered. Okay, they'll get to 25 years. Oh, the 20, in New York, it was 21 years. Missouri, 25 years of labor. But then what? This was just so awful. They're free in Missouri. The law would be they'd be free in Missouri at 25. But their property until the very moment of their 25th birthday. So what can they do before, right before they turn 25? Huh? Or more likely, sell them. They would sell them. It was called down river to the states that really wanted slaves, like Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama. It's called. It, it, they literally called it down river. Sell them. They get the profit, and wherever the, there wouldn't be as many free slaves, right? Because they'd all go down river. Isn't that just horrible? And think about it for a second. 
The slaves lived this life of unimaginable cruelty and terror. That's why slavery functioned. And they get nothing. Except one slave. They're slaves. So if they're sold, let's say, to Mississippi, they don't have that law. They're slaves till they die. Isn't that just horrible? Isn't that one of the worst things you've ever heard? So, it's implied, yes, they wanted freedom. No, it's much more complex. But Southerners can see, oh no. Southern senators and congressmen were like, we can't have this. Because what if Kentucky, the new state of Kentucky, that doesn't have much slaves, that's post made, and they would actually almost do it in the eighteen forties. What if Virginia, Delaware, which had slaves, would start losing these slaves? Last thing, I know the Delaware. Southerners immediately started threatening nullification and secession. Civil war was talked about immediately. In fact, there were fist fights in the cloakroom of the House and the Senate. Which, yes, would be fun. All right. So that is where we'll finish. We've got a little bit left to finish tomorrow. Do a little bit more interpretation. I'll have the essay questions for you tomorrow for those of you who are going to be going on Friday. I don't know no one cares, but I've decided that I'm hungry. Grant, we need a, a snack day. Who wants croissants? I always want croissants, right? Who wants croissants? Uh, oh, I didn't know the I'm going to give a little bit of a long voice. Could someone get one of the lights, please, Greg? You mind getting that? Thank you. Two parts on. Pretty short chapter. I know why I didn't miss that. I got a book. I an online book. Mm -hmm. Pack sheet of paper? Yeah. I go 352, that's not pack sheet of paper. 352. Okay, that's in America. Where are you going? Uh, oh, okay. No. Where are you shipping to? I don't know where you're shipping. Where are you the doors or no it's oh, okay. Okay. What are you gonna have to do? Uh, you know, get them out of the field. I did that one up in my city. And I just want somebody out of it. I don't know much about And I was not for doing a whole lot of work. Are you in the first registry? Okay. Okay. We can tell them about more Yeah, I'm so happy. We did it by horse and I was like, I don't want to do it. It was costly. How many of Okay, on 185. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. You're pretty mad. It's not true. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's true. Do you want this other hard piece of paper? I know, I should have wrote it down. Okay, matter. On 167, there are three multiple places. I want to do the results. Okay? I know they're in the book, but just do the answer. All right? We'll see ya. Don't get hurt. Okay. Who else needs a test? Could you get one on the pantry, dude? Now, see if you can guess what word it spells when you write down the letter. Oh, cool. No. That helps, I I just want 
Monday? Yeah. And you were gone. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, today, Wednesday, were you gone? Today, Wednesday. I know, wishful thinking, man. I mean, sad thinking. Oh. The week is almost done. But then another uh, Monday's coming. Yeah. Only nine more Mondays till Christmas. Yeah, I guess that makes it better. Yeah. yeah.